Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Noe Santos with Reclamation's Lower Colorado Region, and we are very pleased to have Andrew Houtsinger present on lessons learned for the Bill Williams River and Environmental Flow Program. Andrew is the Chief of the Division of Water Resources for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Region 2. He provides water resource and water rights support to 47 national wildlife refuges located in the states of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. Andrew has also served as the chair of the Bill Williams River Corridor Steering Committee for over a decade. This webinar is being hosted by the Desert LCC's Riparian and Aquatic Critical Management Question Team. The purpose of the Riparian and Aquatic Team is to address climate change, water management, and the interactions affecting the physical processes that support springs, aquatic and riparian habitats, species, and human cultures. The team is also charged with investigating viable management options to mitigate negative effects of climate change and other interactions to support ecosystem functions. So thank you again for joining us today, and thank you to Andrew for sharing his work. I'm now going to turn it over to Andrew to begin the presentation. Andrew? Thanks, Noe, um, and big thanks to everyone who's on, on the line this afternoon. This is exciting. I've, I've gone through the the participant list of some 64 folks, and it's, it's absolutely phenomenal to, to see a lot of folks who've been in this conversation of, of working on water-related conservation on the Bill Williams for, for, for many years. Uh, Bill, Bill Warner, Doyle Wilson, lots of other great folk who have been important contributors I, I see on the on, on the webinar. So, so it's a great uh, story to tell that, that is uh, a product of many people's hard work and, and, and perseverance to, to protect and enhance this, this unique and special watershed. So I um, also uh, want to express um, Pat Shaffroth's regrets. He, he tried his best to, to, to be able to shuffle his schedule around, but he's not able to be on the call today. But he's here, as he says, in spirit. So w w with that, this, this is a, let, let me get going I'm, for, for, for folks who are uh, uh, averse to uh, death by PowerPoint. I, I, I will uh, apologize ahead of time. We have 66 slides to get through, and I, I, I have about 45 minutes to, 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 to do so. So I will, uh, some of these will just spend a couple seconds on, but a lot of pretty pictures and, and some pretty cool content here of the work, the EcoFlow work on, on the Bill Williams. So with that, let me give people a flavor of, of the, um, the talk that I'm going to be providing today. So first handful of slides is going to be an overview of the Bill Williams and, and Alamo Dam, uh, a U.S. Army Corps of, of, of Engineers facility, and uh, look at some of the hydrographs, especially a, a, a quick focus on five environmental flow events that, that have been conducted by the Corps between 2005 and 2010. And then we'll lo look at some of the processes behind the environmental flow work that, that we've been working on, as well as some of the tools that have come from that tool development in the, in the context of, of ecological flows. Um, I, sh I should note ahead of time that I, that I interchangeably use the phrase ecological flows and environmental flows. So, so you'll see me going back and forth between those two, the, the, those two uh, words, ecological and environmental. Also, also, this gives us a great chance to, to review a just released a, a, a week or so ago on, online. We'll, we'll see a link later in the talk about a, a new paper that John Hickey, myself, Dr. Shapra, former um, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, um, refuge manager at the Williams, Dick Gilbert, and my, and my close colleague Steve Het Sesney have, have put together on managing water and riparian habitats. So that's, that's an exciting opportunity to talk a little bit about that contribution to, to the body of EcoFlow work on the Bill Williams. And then we'll go into a, a couple, just a handful of, of what I consider key ecological flow questions that, that, that we've been addressing on the Bill Williams. And then I'll do my very best to, to leave time in the hour for, for some questions and answers. So with that, let me, let me jump into it. Um, here's a map to kind of get folks grounded on the landscape. Uh, the Bill Williams River is, is some 5,200 square miles in drainage basin, making it roughly the, the, the third biggest basin that drains completely within the state of Arizona. It is a uh, unique system in, in many regards, one of which is it's highly flashy. It, it really, it, it's either feast or famine on the Bill Williams quite often, and um, statistically it's, it's one of the 
most flashy river systems um, through through some of the analyses we've done in in the state of Arizona has you, you know a, a pretty high range of, of precipitation from year to year. This uh, you, you'll see on that that chart here, average annual discharge of 91 CFS, which really is, a, is a borders on a meaningless statistic since there's really nothing average in such a flashy system. But that has, so it's highly uh, affected by the high flows. And along those lines, the period of record flow that, that, that happened at the turn of the century is, is estimated to have been around 200,000 CFS, whereas, as you will see, in a moment, the Alamo Dam, which was put into gates of Alamo Dam, were closed in 1968, has the maximum controlled release of 7,000 CFS. So it's a dramatic difference between um, the natural hydrograph and, and the managed hydrograph that we're operating under today. So that. A quick cartoon that gives you a sense of, of, of the hydrology th through the floodplain. This is really a coarse cartoon, but but what really the, the, the main message here is, is, is it shows you that, that you have this uh, a very hydrologically connected river between the aquifers and, and, and the river itself, the surface flows, and the, and the surface flow of the Bill Williams can go intermediate, intermed, will, will, will go subsurface um, quite often in, in between flow events, large, large flow events. The Planet Valley, which which is of of high interest to, to, to many folks in, in in the conservation arena, has the deepest portion of alluvium, some 400 feet, whereas oftentimes the the, the, the shallow aquifers are, are are closer to 40 or 50 feet in depth. Planet Valley typically is dry, 95% um, of the time, flows in excess of 100 cfs, approaching 500 cfs for dependable surface water manifestation across the valley are needed for the entire bathtub to be full. And it's that fullness of the bathtub that really predicts what amount of water the, the downstream Bill Williams River National Wildlife Refuge will see. So it's, it's that kind of a spring that, that is the output of the, of, the, of the downstream side of the Planet Valley. Um, much of the work that the Bill Williams River Corridor steering stone over, over, over these many years is, is really looking at Alamo Dam and operational opportunities to meet, meet the mission of Alamo Dam, as, as, you know, which is primarily flood flow in nature, uh, um, but, but also try to e e eke out some refinements for environmental benefits as well as other human concerns. As mentioned, Alamo Dam was, was built in 1968. It's got about a million acre feet of storage capacity. That w with a maximum outlet of, of around 7,000 CFS, or 200 cubic meters per second. Um, interesting to note that, again, on, on average, this is a basin that, that, that w will generate around 100,000 um, acre feet per year. Not a very dependable statistic, since, as I noted, this is such a flashy system. There really is no average. But if you were to have average conditions, Alamo Dam could store for 10 years without releasing a drop. So that, that's something for folks to be mindful of. The size of this of this body of water is, 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 is pretty impressive. So, you know, the, oh, the, this graph portrays kind of if, if you look on the left, you, you get to that, that the 1890s event where, where um, we had this uh, period of record flow moving through that 200,000 CFS event that, that I made reference to. And then you go through the the, the, the 40s, and and, and and as you got into the early 50s, there 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 was increasing concern about the impact that that the, the flooding Bill Williams had upon the Colorado River Valley, especially in the, in the Yuma area. And so in 19, yeah, I think exactly in 48 is is when the uh, Congress passed a. a, a, a a law to be able to uh, authorize the, the construction of Alamo Dam that was completed in 1968. And this graph totally shows you how effective Alamo Dam has been in curtailing the flood flows. Um, my apologies, this graph is a little out, out of date. I'll, I'll make the time down the road to, to add the, the, the most current 10 years, but, but clearly there's been a huge decrease in, in the large floods and a commensurate increase in, in the base flow releases, which, which we'll, we'll focus on in, in, in a, uh, additional slides. 
this is a, a quick schematic of the Alamo Dam storage allocation. Um, I don't want to spend much time on this graph, but just to show you how, how the Arm Corps have, have um, separated the different volumes of water based, based on L dam L or reservoir elevation. Uh, a really important component of, of the body of work on, on, on the Bill Williams is back in the late 80s and the early 90s as, as, as the, the Bill Werners and, and the Joe Evelyns may, may, may recall um, that there is a, a really strong push to, to try to re reoperate Alamo Dam in a way that had more environmental sensitivities. And what, what was forthcoming from that reoperation that was eventually blessed in 2003 in, in the congressionally authorized um, water control manual was this 1125 target elevation. So, so the, the concept here very quickly is there will be base flows that, that go from 0 to 50 CFS um, based on season um, the, uh, as, as long as the reservoir elevation is below 1125. Once the reservoir with, um, has, in, has inflows um, contributing to an elevation that goes above 1125, the, the, the current schedule, and again, this has been in place for some 20 years, since the mid-90s effectively, has a 1,000 CFS increase in discharge for every additional foot of, of elevation. So at 1126, you get 1,000 CFS. 1127, you get to 2,000 all the way up to 1132, where you hit the maximum release capacity of 7,000 CFS. And as we've seen in, in, in you know, over the handful of years that I've been involved in the Bill Williams, on occasion you'll get these big storms that will fill in, in in the lake, and you'll stay according to the strict adherence to the schedule, which there is a lot of flexibility that the Corps can operate under. Um, you'll stay at a 7,000 CFS until the, the, the lake elevation goes back below 1132, and then you prorate it downward. So as you get down to 1126, theoretically, you'd be back at around 1,000 CFS, and then come 1125, your base flow would, would, would continue. So. Much of, of, of the EcoFlow work that we've done on the Bill Williams is, is, has been um, supported in, in, in critical and, and, and very meaningful ways by the Sustainable Rivers Project, which, which, is, which is a really what I find an inspirational point of, of uh, collaboration between the Nature Conservancy and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. There's some nine sustainable river projects across the country. You'll note on this graph that, that only two of the, of, of the nine are west of the Mississippi. Um, Bill Williams and the Willamette are, are, are those two. And uh, so that, that's a, uh, we're, we're kind of filling a special niche. And, and, and again, the Sustainable Rivers Project, as it notes here in this slide, is really trying to push this incorporation of environmental flows into some form of adaptive reservoir management. And so we've been really excited over these years to, to have the, the Alamo be such an important, the work around Alamo and the Bill Williams be such an important contributor to trying to, to look at reservoir management in a way that is progressive ecologically, yet still maintains other important human considerations. Um, so moving on a little bit, from the Sustainable Rivers Project, this is a, we've established kind of our scientific framework, if you will, um, from the ecologically sustainable water management approach, which is, came from a Brian Richter, who was for, for many years was, was the head of the Nature Conservancy's Freshwater Initiative. And, and he, he wrote in, in 2003 with, with other um, authors, the ecologically sustainable water management, managing river full flows for ecological integrity. And so basically ESWIM, if you allow me to go to the acronym, is, is generate the environmental flow recommendations that, that critically important are time specific with numeric goals that, that are meaningful to dam operators, represent the whole ecosystem, in, in so far as we are able to capture the, the flow biota relationships, ha has a strong level of scientific credibility because it's building on, 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 on many river systems, many years of, of, of river science, and uh, uh, of great importance, it really has this adaptive implementation. You know, a, a lot of the work that, that river science engages in re reservoir operations is, is, is 
is still, you know, it's kind of cutting edge, and the Bill Williams is part of that cutting edge. And so you have to, you know, through, do some experimentation and and see what happens. Keep your eyes open. Um, this to, to the left of the graph here, it shows you what is in, in this version a six-step process. Uh, other versions of eSwim is four-step, five-step, but I, but I've chose for for today's purposes to, to kind of slice it into six steps. So you get this estimate of ecological flow requirement, which which will be um, commented upon in just a moment in, in some level of, of detail. You look at the influence of human activities as your step two. You then go to the, to, to the difficult discussion of identifying those areas of potential incompatibility. You get this as step four, a, a, a collaborative dialogue um, that, that, that supports these discussions, and that's really the, the niche that the Bill Williams River Corridor Steering Committee has filled. And then you go through this, this as step five shows you this experimentation. And, and you know, the Bill Williams is, is this wonderfully um, simple, in, in some regards, watershed where, where you don't have the same um, ge geopolitical uh, complications that almost any other watershed of, of its size in the American West really are, are, are saddled with. There's not very many people that live in the basin. Alamo Dam is, is, is kind of the, the, the key variable in, in how it is operated. And since there's not a hydroelectric plant on Alamo Dam, um, as long as the Corps can meet their core responsibilities for flood control and, and a, a recreational fishery, there, there is an ecosystem component there that, that allows us to do these experimentations which then all funnels into this uh, design of a, a, an adaptive management plan, starting to modify the release strategy that the core implements for, for these uh, other purposes. So we'll, we'll see this graph a couple more times through, through the discussion, but there's a quick rundown on, on, on the ecologically sustainable water management approach. Um, you know, so, and it really funnels into this this key consideration of, of, of you know what are the, the important life history components that are tied to the hydrographs. So, so here's an ecological a conceptual ecological flow model for, model for for a generic southwestern river system that was generated by Jean Marie Haney um, of, of the Arizona chapter of TNT. That kind of shows you the the, the 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 pieces of the hydrograph and the, the um, biological wildlife um, uh, relevance. So whether you're talking the seed release of cottonwood willows, you know, let me try to get fancy here and, and, and draw with my with my little arrow. Whether you're talking seed release, come on, seed release of cottonwoods, or or or, or southwest willow flycatcher needs, or, or or you're looking at at some of the very important native fisheries that that, that are, are still existing. Unfortunately, only in the upper portions of the Bill Williams, there's really no native fisheries of, that have been observed in the, on, on the lower portion below Alamo Dam for many years. But, but really, these are the different parts of the hydrograph that, that we want to be able to resurrect, even if in, in greatly reduced scale and scope, to, to maintain some level of balance between the, um, the ecological conditions and, and other needs of water that, that our society has for, for bodies of water like Alamo Reservoir. And again, going back to you know, why is the billions important? It's because we have critters like these that, are, that, that call it its home. So, you know, we have threatened and endangered species. Um, bald, bald eagles are, 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 are an important piece. Um, th thanks, Bill Werner, for, for, for your recommendation to, to make sure that people recognize that through the evolution of the work on the Bill Williams, bald eagles were, were critically important in the, in, in the mid-1990s because they had occupied a snag in the middle of Alamo Lake that, that, that mandated different reservoir elevations and really kind of curtailed the, the operational um, freedom of, of the Army Corps to do different things. And, and then by the end of the 90s, maybe early 2000s, that, that eagle nest had, had, had was the, the tree that hosted the eagles had fallen in, in, into the lake, and, and it was no longer a, a, an operational constraint. But again, main, main message of this graph is, is, is uh, to, to just highlight how, how uh, what a unique river system that the Bill Williams still represents. It, it, it is kind of a, uh, one of the last best existing um, situations where you have these, these gallery forest, cottonwood willow, and, and, and the other aquatic environments that are still largely functioning which makes the Bill Williams very unique. Um, 
here on, 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 on here, here's Pat being, being here in spirit. Uh, you know, he, he looks at this as a picture of the delta, right, when the Bill Williams goes into Lake Havasu, a relatively re recent picture that, that tells the story of, of, of highly vegetative encroachment. You know, this, this picture here, and we'll see a couple other shots of, the, of, of this is the biggest piece of, of Cottonwood Willow dominated what we refer to as the gallery forest. Studies have been done that, that indicate that this, what we see here in front of us, is, represents some 50% of, of this type of habitat that still remains in the lower Colorado River, basically going from Hoover Dam down to Mexico. So you know, this, this, because we've reduced the, the, the really, really catastrophic high flows and we've, we've elevated the base flows, we've kind of set up this artificially um, ideal situation for, for riparian trees to grow, as opposed to how, how it was once upon a time. If, if you notice this, this picture of the, of the Delta in 1953 before the gates of Alamo Dam were closed, which again happened in 1968, they would get rotorooted every, every couple years. The, the recurrence interval of 7,000 CFS pre-dam is around two years. The recurrence interval of, of 7,000 CFS post-dam is, is, is closer to 15 years. So we've really reduced the, the, the um, frequency of the big events, and of course the magnitude never gets above 7,000. So we're a, a very different system than, than was in place naturally, and that highlights one of one of the unique opportunities the Bill Williams represents, which is kind of making up for lost habitat that is probably not recoverable on the main stem of the Colorado River. And the Colorado River Valley, which is as everyone knows, is, is, is much more developed levees and, and, and multiple series of dams and, and a lot of needs for water um, use, exporting and, and staying in, in, in the valley for agricultural purposes. And so the Bill Williams represents this kind of a, a place that we're making up for lost habitat elsewhere. So, so it is, is, is really on, on a lot of managers' radar screen to, to, um, to fill that niche, even, even if we acknowledge that it's, it's artificial and, and how sustainable it is, is is an active point of discussion, and I think is a valid one. Um, Bill Williams is 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 a, a really a geomorphically active system. This is a great picture. One of my favorite. I think it's from 2005, where we're right in the in, in the upper eastern portion of of the Planet Valley, looking onto the BLM wilderness areas, and the Swansea wilderness areas. So we're looking east up river. And, and so it's, it's got this highly transportable sediment substrate that, that w w when, the, when the Bill Williams does flow, it, it, it is something to, 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 to witness for sure. And so there's a, a pretty picture for folks' consideration. And he, here's a quick snapshot of the environmental flows that have happened, uh, um, at, at least in, over the last 15 years. In 2005, the, the last big El Nino, which, which I'll just pause for a moment and say we, we thought 2000, it, it, this last year, the 2016 was going to be an, uh, another big El Nino. Didn't they call it Godzilla? Well, it ended up being more of a Minnie Mouse kind, kind of scenario on, on the Bill Williams. Didn't the, the El Nino of this last winter behind us was, was actually quite paltry. The 2015-2016 did not manifest as everyone expected. But in 2005, we got a lot of water. And so, th so there's the maximum release of 7,000. Uh, flood control was a driving force. We also, with Core's wise operation, were, were able to manage the, the, the inflows in, in a way that, that uh, allowed us to pause. And a lot, lot of the water came in in 2004, went in around, around Thanksgiving, and we started flooding, and, and a lot of big flows in, in January of 2005. But the core held a good portion of that water until mid-March of 2005, which is when the, the cottonwood willow seeds were, were in the environment. So also kept a little bit of water back for a 2006 pulse, which was is one of the more important events that we've had on the Bill Williams because it was wasn't storm driven. It was a, a storage that was not released, but, but kept it, the lake at above 1125 in between 2005 and 2006. We'll see more in the 2006 scenario here in, in, in subsequent slides. 2007, 2008 were, were, were different spike flows that, that, that moved through. Um, a, a lot of driving um, interest in, in the aquatic environment to see what these spike flows would do to, to macroinvertebrates. 
trying to set the stage potentially for evaluating is, is there a niche for, for, for a, a native aquatics to be reintroduced in this system? That's still an open question. Chances are it, it would be very challenging. Interestingly to note that the 2007 and 2008 pulses were, were not storm, were not derived from inflows from storms, but, but, but rather they were to uh, followed a, a course that we refer to as, as, as a volume neutral, which is, which is a, a way of, of capturing that we reduce the volume of base flows as, as, as the rate of base flow is called out in the schedule. So instead of putting forward 40 CFS 24-7, we ended up reducing that to 20 CFS for a period of weeks. And the resulting water savings, if you will, was, was the volume of water under the curve that supported these spike flows. So at the end of the event, Alamo Reservoir was where it would have been without the event happening because of those reduced base flows. So an interesting tool as we move into to, to periods of drought, it, it becomes um, debatable whether or not that's something we can do very often, have, have a long list of, of constituencies that, that, that would probably be concerned about that, um, fisheries up in, in, in Alamo Lake, for, for instance. And then finally, 2010 was a, was a wet year, and, and we were able to push through 3,000 CFS for, for a day and a half with a bunch of pre-work done, uh, a deployment of 12 different teams of scientists, and, and, and did some really neat stuff. Lo looking at the HEC RAS model was, was one of those byproducts of the 2010 event. Um, and again, I just I, I can't speak in strong enough terms about how important it, it is that we have the core support to do these kind of environmental flows, because it really establishes the special niche that the Bill Williams represents for, for, for um, the body of science and for, for managers and government agencies and, and other interests who are interested in improving our ability to manage these, these arid desert river systems. Here's the 2006 event. I, I won't spend much time on this, but this is something we, we well, that was really an important event because we had enough lead time to, to, to do some neat stuff. This was classically designed from, from the, the, the the ground up, if you will, to, to be a, a spike to further agitate the, the, the substrate to establish new sites for, for, um, for, for colonization, colonization of, of native trees and seedlings. A lot of that work had probably already been done sufficiently in 2005, uh, but, but then we had this recessional limb, which is one of the key components of, of, of our operational considerations as, as we will capture in a moment. Going through the environmental flows process that, that, that we um, walked through over these years is, is the next set of slides. So again, here's the e-swim, steps one, two, three, and four. We're focusing for the next couple slides, mostly on step one, and, and, and then we'll look a little bit on, on some of the progress we've made on, on, on sussing out, uh, illuminating steps two and three. So in 2005, we uh, had a workshop in, in, in beautiful Tempe where we, we had over 50 scientists locked in a room at, at ASU, and, and, and we told them, OK, we're going to work through environmental flow requirements, ecosystem flow requirements. And we're, and we're going to lock the door for three days and, and, until we come up with, with, with these requirements. So, so this is a, a, a USGS publication that Shafroth and, and, and Vanessa Bouchamp had, had put together. That really tells a lot of, the, of that story in that process. But the, the primary charge to, to the group was, was whatever your ecosystem flow requirements are, where you're trying to, to, to link the hydrograph to, to the life history of the biota, you got to make sure that you're establishing it in terms of timing, with seasonal categories, frequency, duration, rate of change, and um, likely contingencies. So, so if things aren't, aren't occurring as you imagine they would, you know, how, how do you respond? So, so, so this is a really key piece of the e-swim methodology that, that you provide the biological foundation in, in, of, of what you're shooting for, what your biological objective is in such a way that it's meaningful and implementable by, by a dam operator. So that, that was how we move forward. Is, is uh, again these 50 scientists, engineers, and natural resource man managers were all we had. We had a big um, plenary 
full group, and then we broke it up into these subgroups of aquatics, riparian birds, and riparian mammals, and each one of those subgroups had the charge of, well, what is the ecosystem flow requirement in, in the low flow scenario? What about in the flood scenario? And, and then those groups then re reforged, re re reformed, and, and, and developed these, these synthesized unified low flow prescriptions and unified flow prescriptions that, that then all following these, these purposes or the, the parameters I made reference to a moment ago. Oh, I think there was damage. So these bad boys, the, the definitional portions of, of, of what those um, flow prescriptions look like. Um, again, really important to note that I think one of the most important components of, of eSWIM is that this step one, defining ecosystem flow requirements, is explicitly done without recognition of all the constraints and, and, and the altered hydrologic conditions that, that are in place in many of our river systems. It, it, it was a, a, a very difficult kind of intellectual um, thing to get across that, well, well why, are, why are we planning higher floods than 7,000 CFS because the river, the dam can't support anything above 7,000 CFS. But, but the rationale behind that I, I found very persuasive, which is, for your first step, to as rich a restoration of what the ecology needed with a natural hydrograph in place. And then as we walk through the swim process, we'll start re refining what, what, where we can reach those natural conditions and where we can't, where we can reach them and reduce scale and scope and where we can't touch them at all. So through, through that process, we ended up with, with these ecosystem flow requirements, of which there are nine flows that are tied to ecological objectives. And, and, and as noted, you, you have you know, th three of those flows are, 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 are above 7,000 CFS. And again, that was done intentionally. So, so you have your base flow components, flood flow components, and then you, you look at all the seasonalities. And, and, and you'll note each one of these prescriptions has those components. Talk, talks about the, the, the timing and, and, and the, the free frequency duration, rate of change, and, and, and contingencies as, as needed. So this is available in the report I made I, that, that Dr. Shafrock put together, if you're interested in more detail. Again, looking, looking at our graph here now, focusing a little bit more on, on uh, steps two and steps three of, of this process, determining influence of human activities and those identification of areas of potential incompatibilities. Um, in 2009, the, the steering committee met and, and, and we generated through, through a handful of, of, of weeks some 131 constraints that, that, that were evaluated and scored for being very unlikely, likely, or very likely to conflict with, it, with the EcoFlow prescription. Sorry about the tininess of the font there, but um, these scored constraints were then narrowed down to 27 top tier examples that were organized in, in, into the nine categories that you can see in column left, riparian fisheries, wildlife, all the way down to, to water supply and demand. But the, these 27 considerations are, are, are things that we really need to grapple with and have, and have the hard discussion of how, how can we promote X if, if it gets in the way and conflicts with Y. So that's one of the, the ways of bringing home this, this uh, body of work in a, in a way that, that reduces conflict and not to say that we, we do have conflict on the Bill Williams for sure, but, but I think we, we've really been able to, to, to manage around uh, different needs from different constituencies in a way that's respectful and, and, and building a, a dialogue that is critical when, when you're dealing with these, these these difficult management considerations of, of our desert river systems. So again, those are a quick overview of the steps two and three, um, kind of setting the stage for, for the subsequent work of, of EcoFlow tool development. Um, back in, in 2005 and 2006, we, we spent, an, uh, we had a, a, a little bit of money that, that was per lobbying efforts on the part of the Sustainable Rivers Project that, that that Congress agreed to put money per, per TNC's um, advocation into the Corps' budget that allowed us to do some really um, good things. Among those good things were the establishment of, of, of some 60 permanent hydrologic cross-sections where we actually went into the river system and, and established um, highly precise head pins in the points of these cross-sections and 
and uh, cleared the vegetation between the head pins. Uh, unfortunately, that was a one shot. We had money once, and, and we've tried to resurrect some of those cross sections, but boy, howdy, the vegetative encroachment has, has in some of them makes it seem as if we never cut the cross sections to begin with. But this was kind of the, the, the uh, skeleton upon which we placed, um, we put meat on the bones, if you will, to, to, the, to then adv advance the river sciences and put some neat, neat tools in place to, to better manage this, this, this river system. So, so this is a, an indication of, of, of some of those enhancements where we had a, what I consider kind of a first generation LIDAR flight in 2006 that told us it generated a, a, a digital elevation model, digital terrain model, and you're, you're able to use the, 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 the permanent real cross sections as, as, as caliber, calibratory um, assets that, that get then interpolated in between to, to support the, the modeling effort, the hydraulic modeling effort, which we chose to use the one-dimensional model of HEC RAS, uh, the, the CORS baby. And so here's, here's a quick um, picture of, of some of the HEC RAS output that, that, that our friend Dan Christophimo from the Army Corps um, LA district was, was, the, was the author of. Here, here's a graphical output that shows the different um, expressions of, of, of floods. So you see the, the, the red le levels. That, that shows what a 50,000 CFS might have looked like. The, the, the bluish gray is, is a 5,000 um, flood, flood event. And then you get to see all, all, all the cross sections. Of, of important note is to, to, to look here to the left, this turbidity plume that, that, that's going underneath the, the highway, Arizona Highway 95 bridge and entering into Lake Havasu. Uh, this is, is a reflective of, 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 a, of a sediment rich system that when it, it brings a lot of, of, of sediment into the Colorado River. Uh, Colorado River color red river as, as, as some like to break down the the, the uh, origin of that word Colorado you know once the Colorado River was a much browner system than it is today as, as, as many, many people will, will, uh, will recognize but nonetheless this, this is an important illustration of the challenges that, that one of the challenges that, that the Williams represents for, for the Army Corps and the rest of the constituencies that, that are interested in these, these higher environmentally based flows is it, it sits the Central Arizona project in, 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 in a challenging position to be able to, to deal with these high, high, high sediment loads because their Mark Wilmer pumping plant doesn't do very well in pumping water into the CAP efficiently if, if, if the water is very muddy. So it's just a, important that people understand that that's one of those primary considerations that, that need to be put in place as, as flood flows are, are, are being um, evaluated and advocated for. Um, set of tools uh, or, or, or output from one of our most important tools, the, the HEC RAS runs, again, um, put together by Van Crisostomo. This is a 2008 um, e evaluation that kind of shows you the travel time through, through cross sections that we were studying. So we, so we had a, a team at most every one of these cross sections to evaluate whether or not we were actually seeing the flows that we anticipated and what the travel times were, which is an important consideration as you're, as you're trying to, to do good science. Which then led us into this, what I view as a very rich and rewarding um, effort where, where we started to doing, the, you know, as in, in rich and rewarding, especially in the context of, of exporting some of the lessons learned on the Bill Williams to, to helping manage other river systems that you don't have the same luxury of doing um, experimental flows like we do on this river system. So we've combined the hydraulic and ecological models to help predict that the uh, eco-responses to, to different flow management choices using the, the hydraulic model of HEC-RAS and then pushing that into this ecosystem functions model, which is a ATC EFM linking stage and flow data to, to ecological response. Um, and it, this was developed by, by John Hickey, who's out of ATC Davis there in California. And it's really been, a, as we'll, we'll, we'll see through, through a handful of slides to come, it's really been a, a very helpful and powerful tool to, to kind of talk in more quantitative terms and more accessible terms in a graphical context of, of, of how these ecoflows might, might manifest. Um, 
HEC EFM can can do a lot of things. We're going to focus on Cottonwood Willow recruitment for for, for uh, 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 it's been one of our main focus points through through time. But but it does. What we have on, on monsoon forage, native fish spawning, winter forage cleansing, fish flushing, riparian rework. I mean, so there's a lot of different applications. And in, in, in essence, if, if if there's a stage of velocity driven component of ecological interest. You, EFM can, can use any hydraulic model, be HECRAS or, 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 or others, to, to, to try to better estimate what the ecological response is going to be. So, also, the EFM body of work allowed us to, to kind of resurrect some of the, the historic hydrology and look at what was the functions of, of the flood flows of, of, of days gone by and, and how did those flood flows what kind of ecological function do they serve, and, and, and what does that tell us about in our in our in our modern day situation? What, what we really want to what's achievable, what's not, what's what's working towards resurrecting components in this river system that were there prior to the establishment of Alamo Dam that that again happened right about here in 1968. So a couple examples. Um, so. Looking at native pre-recruitment has is, is, is really been one of the most powerful expressions of, of EFM because that, that is, is the riparian community is, 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 of such, is so top of mind for, for, for the managers uh, charged with managing the Bill Williams and, and Alamo Dam. So, and, and as we'll talk about, the, the recessional limb of the hydrograph is absolutely critical. How, how quickly you reduce the post-peak um, flow rates such that establish seedlings, hopeful that you did establish seedlings, um, their, their, their root production can keep pace with that dropping groundwater table, which has, has been shown to be, be highly in, important for um, long-term survivability of, of your, your um, newly established um, seedlings, be they native or non-native. So for instance, you know, with a one-inch um, re recession, this is the land that, that would be occupied in a one-inch one recessional piece, um, roughly equating to 411 acres. Of course, we know that a lot of the area is going to be inundated, um, if not permanently, at least for, for enough days. And I think three, four weeks is, is, the, is the standard rule of thumb that you won't have successful viable recruitment. So you take that area of inundation out. So the 411 acres of potential recruitment really can't get quickly with a one-inch recessional hydrograph, one inch of flow reduction per day brings it down to 67 acres. Um, if you look at a two-inch scenario, you'd, you'd, you'd end up getting that. If, in fact, the, the seeds are able to keep the seedlings, root production are able to keep up with that level of, of, of water level reduction, you'd probably, we predicted something on the, on the order of 164 acres would be would be established, and, and again, um, three inch was was another um, value that, that that we modeled, and, and this is mid 2000s modeling. This is work that we did in 2006 and 2007. But but if in fact the the, the tree species of interest were able to, to keep up with 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 a, with a rapidly declining hydrograph, we we would get some predicted 646 acres. Uh, almost a, a, a tenfold increase of what we would have seen in, in, in a more conservative one inch recessional limb were, were that to be achievable um, from the biologic perspective. So uh, there, there's a quick graph. This is, this is the 2006 event again that we're, we're, we're typifying. So, so we're able to see these, these levels of, of recessional limb drop offs so three inch per day Two inch per day, one inch per day. So, again, this a lot. A lot this, while the 2006 event was, was a real deal, you know, we, we're still refining the, these understandings. But this is a really important point of contribution that this, this body of work represents, I think, to, to the body science. Another quick expression of, of some of the power of, of EFM is, is, is looking at this riparian rework and pre dam conditions. You know, what would have seen a rework of the valley of, 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 of this magnitude of, of something, you know, over 5,528 acres. 
post dam surprisingly it's, it's, it's only a 20 percent reduction in extent so we really see that the 7,000 CFS you know that post dam controlled flow could really make a difference to, to, to a, a pretty significant portion of the floodplain and all that then is kind of sets the stage for, for our, our, our many partners and, and to, to, to make a difference and so this what I this is one of my favorite pictures of one of my favorite spots on the planet which is planet ranch um, it sets the stage for, for you know a, a piece of ground that that these kind of ecological flow considerations could really make a difference so that this this for, for folks who are not in the know planet Planet Ranch is, 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 has been bought by, by um, the, the multi-species conservation program, or at least the floodplain of Planet Ranch, and is now owned and will be managed in, in coordination with the, with the MSCP and the Arizona Game and Fish, who owns the land and water through, through, through a, a, a process negotiated with the previous owner, Freeport McMoran. So this, this is just a you know, potential area for, for a lot of this work to, to, to be meeting the needs of, of, of managers who, who are trying to change the, the conditions on, 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 on the ground. So, which bring, brings me to, to, to the recent publication I made reference to at the beginning, Managing Water and Riparian Habitats on the Bill Williams River with Scientific Benefit for Other Desert River Systems. So that, that's an Army Corps of Engineers report to the desert landscape, the DLCC, again, it's available online. I'm going a little bit behind time here, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to zoom through a, a couple of these. But, but really, the, 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 the main value-added piece of, 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 this, of this publication, which, which I, I hope folks get a chance to, to, to look at, is to codify the flow ecology relationships for riparian species as operational rules for water managers. And, and then secondly, to test these rules under different climate scenarios. Here's a, a quick grab of, uh, of the software that was used. So, so you're looking at, at, at kind of ecological um, life cycle um, ties to, to, the, to the hydrology. And then, and then you actually have your, your, your river hydraulics. Here's a, a, a sign of all. And now we have 341 cross-sections that have been established for, for, for this. Back in the day, 2006, we, we, we largely used one cross-section. At a, at a time, so we've really improved our, our sophistication. Here's a, 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 a good graph, a set of graphs that shows you model development and, and, and you know, looking at conceptual hydrographs on, on, on the left-hand side here. That, that, that you then look at, here's, the, here's the examples of the 2006 event, and it, and it really shows you different parts of the hydrograph in, in this, this portion manifest themselves differently on the landscape, predicted to manifest themselves. So this is at the bottom of the river system at, at, uh, where, at, where the Bill Williams hits the Colorado River. So these are responses in, on the refuge area here, and then Planet Ranch here, and then the BLM lands up top. But it really highlights how, how diverse the landscape is and how you're going to have different reactions over these 40 river miles between Alamo Dam and Lake Cavatoo. Um, then, then through through these improved opportunities to, to really push um, you know the science forward, you know we're we're able to take all these statistical results and splice the GIS maps to promote thinking of things in terms of area distribution of occurrence is is, is, is a key component here. I have to leave it there for considerations of time. Also, set the stage for for some pretty robust model calibration and and. We've seen our very cal encouraging um, re results from, from our calibration. Statistics show that our model parameters are predictive of observed results. So this has allowed us this pretty robust use of, of, of many, many days and weeks of, of scientists out counting observed patch observations of what's growing where. And, and the, that has allowed us to tell us tell a story that, hey, we're doing pretty good. We're never going to be perfect, but, but we're at actually the modeling work that we're doing is, 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 is reflective of, of observed conditions, which is very heartening. And then it allows us to start pu pushing ourselves towards, OK, well, well you know, how, how do you then re really uh, uh, apply these, these modeling considerations 
and, and, and this is a, a complicated graph, which, which again, in, in consideration of time, I, I, I'm going to cut to the quick here. But you know, again, if, you know, our first order goal here is water efficiency. We want to use only as much water, volume of water as needed to maximize our desired ecological responses, be it recruitment or otherwise. And so, if, if you look at this three-dimensional graph here on the on the on the bottom right-hand corner, you, you see this um, peak, peak flows, and, and these are in meters, cubic meters per second, and recruitment area on. on on the y-axis here. Well, basically, our, our take home is that this is the sweet spot. Within this area here, you're, you're able to, to have a sense that you're using only as much water that has a desired ecological response. Certainly would not be the case if we were focused on this, this level where we're having high, high flows, but, but, but the recruitment is, 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 is estimated to be significantly lower, which then lets, lets us come to what I think this is kind of the money slide where, where you, you look at, at the application of, of this into a operational guidance. And then this is where the, you know, the, the, the dam operators' use of this information be, makes it meaningful. Um, and again, if you'll uh, pay, pay witness to the, the 2006, you know, we, we really have a sense that we could have done better, that there was some uh, re recruitment potential that wasn't realized. And maybe if we started a little bit higher, these, these are in cubic meters per second, but we started around 500 CFS to start the recessional limb. We could have started, and that's in the blue line here, could have started a little bit higher. And then this blue line tapered off relatively slowly. We could have tapered off a little bit more quickly and still had the reaction of, 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 of the ecological response that, that we were, were hopeful for. So, so this is really critical that, that you know, if in fact our, our predictions are 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 on are 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 in any way accurate, we, we imagine we'd have some you know, 76 percent potential of, of, of improved re um, recruitment areas. Which then another component of the, of the, of this study was was these climate considerations, doing temperature and precipitation, and and, the, and, and again this is a complicated graph that that is that is well described in the publication, but. But basically, in a nutshell, what we're seeing is that really the driving, the change that we're seeing uh, is you know that there is some uh, a, a bunch of uh, it's 105 global circulation models that covered 150 years of projected conditions, and all of them, without exception, showed that that we're going to um, things are going to get hotter. But there was there wasn't as as, as firm agreement that that, that uh, we we were a, a whole lot of precipitation changes were going to happen. So there's an emerging hypothesis that maybe really what this is more of an ecological response to, to climate change, not so concretely a, a, a hydrologic response. So I want people to take that in, in, into account um, as, as they hopefully get a chance to read this paper. Also did uh, some downscaling, which did, was difficult to interpret, but, but basically, you know, we, we, we went we went through this process of trying to look at, at greater detail of, of, of scaling this work down. And, and, and these are some of the, you know, again, this projected air temperature changes are intuitive and significant precipitation, more subtle and, and complex. You know, so, so as I mentioned, this, this climate change is, is, is expected, expected to be more influential ecologically than, than hydrologically. So really the take home here, if, 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 if I can summarize, is, is that, you know, we, we think it's going to get hotter, hotter probably get slightly drier, but, but, it, but it probably translates that we're going to have fewer recruitment opportunities, so let's do our very best to make the most of, 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 of those opportunities. Um, not not going to read this bullet by bullet. I'm running out of, I have run out of time, so I apologize to everybody on, on running along here, but you know, this direct incorporation of flow ecology knowledge is, is into operational guidance is, is really something that, that, that is an important contributor of authors and collaborators for this project very, very sincerely thank the Desert LCC and the Rec and Bureau of Reclamation for supporting the work. So make sure I, I made the time to, to give that important acknowledgement. Otherwise, this work would not have happened. A couple environmental flow questions. Again, apologize for running over. Um, folks, stay with me if you, if you can for a couple more minutes. Uh, do seedlings survive and grow into trees? 
you know, our, our, our populace and salix, uh, cottonwood and willow, favored over tamarisk, the, the, the answer I mean, increasingly seems to be yes. As you can see, these changes in, 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 in plot dominance and, and, and type abundance, patch type of abundance, sh shown uh, differently in, in this picture. So, so this is encouraging. It seems like with the, the proper type of hydrograph management, we can encourage the native components and, and discourage, or at least not un unnecessarily help the, 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 the invasive. You flow and vent on the Bill Williams support the recruitment box predictions. And, then, and here's a capture of the re recruitment box. It's, this is a lot better in PowerPoint land than it is in PDF because it's an animated slide. But, but in essence, so you can't read half the text there, for which I apologize. But um, since uh, PDF is the only one we could get to work smoothly with this with this webinar, um, you know, we, we have what we have. But in essence, the answer is yes, that we, we think the recruitment box, which is a well-grounded in, 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 in literature, um, Appreciation it, it is largely con confirmed by the work on the on the Bill Williams River. Another question: Do do managed flow events on the Bill Will effectively change channel position and cover type? Again, yes. It, it seems like since 1994, when, when in essence the, the the change in operations became effective from the Corps' perspective, that we've really seen this trend of more and more Tammy uh, abundance has, has gone in the opposite direction, and we're now we're getting more of a native a native um, um, growth rate proportionally. Environmental flows before and after. This, this, this is a, a, what I found a pretty powerful sequence of, uh, of showing uh, flows in February of 2006, uh, May of 2006, April 2007, and, and, and uh, a, a brown, but still those are all live trees growing, growing but, but, but in the winter. So you know, we, we really do see this, this um, uh, effectiveness of environmental flows. Cr cr critical that we focus on the need for peak flows, sediments, a, a master variable that needs to be accounted for. Us. Um, and, and you know, so, so we have this uh, native woody vegetation surviving floods in a, in a rate that's higher than the, than the non-natives. So that again, tool development. Well, lots of good stuff happening here. A quick acknowledgement of not only Dr. Shafroth but also of, of Aunt, Dr. Andrew Wilcox, who, who's out of the University of Montana. He, he built the slide for us and has done a lot of the field work. So she, he's a geomorphologist, a fluvial geomorphologist out of the University of Montana. So I'm um, getting close to the end. So when the, when the rains do come, you know, just generically, let's, let's do our best to manage these high flows with biotic goals and objectives in mind. So you got, you got the big flows. You, you know the cottonwood willow dispersal. You know the, 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 so that's cottonwood in the green, willow in the orange. Tammy seed, seed availability that starts in, in, in April sometime and goes on through October. Uh, that, that then generates the beginnings of, of, of new forest, which is really the thing that I, I, I personally say is the most fulfilling thing I've done in my career of, of, of working for over 30 years in the conservation arena, seeing relatively subtle changes in the hydrograph manifest in some really big, significant changes in, in what we, we see on the landscape. So a couple, two more slides and I'm done. Um, strong confirmation of the lessons learned, strong confirmation of recruitment box model, even with dam limited flows, 7,000 still is able to rework the floodplain sufficiently for seedbed preparation. And these managed hydrographs can really favor the survival of native trees over invasives. Higher peak flows preferable to longer durations as we focus on hydrograph observations, key recessional land considerations, Time to, to match the native seedling release, you know, which starts for cottonwoods probably in, in, in the month of March and carry into late, late February, early March, and carry into in, into the beginnings of April. And then um, it's really important that we continue to study and manage the recessional limb of these hydrographs. Our, our 2.5 centimeter per day, inch per day re re recession, which translates in the building to about 20 CFS, is about our starting point, but it certainly is something that we're continuing to adapt and refine as more information is made available. And again, I'll stop with this one where you know it all depends on monitoring flow and biota. So whether you're looking at, at seedling establishment or sediment dynamics, beaver impacts, different aquatic considerations, the, the, the core um, river science and engineering, you know, monitoring is what, what is, is, is uh, absolutely critical to be able to say, are things that we expect to be happening happening? Here, here's a quick capture of 
this is way back in 2005, but these, these are the kind of considerations and mon monitoring considerations that we put in place on, on, on the Bill Williams. So a couple minutes over time. Um, uh, sure, made this talk a lot quicker when I was at my house yesterday, but I apologize for running over, but, but I'm wondering if we have any time left for uh, questions and or comments. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, we can definitely take some, some questions here. It looks like uh, Katie Crossman has one there in the, in the chat. Um, everyone else, if you have a question, feel free to enter into the chat menu or you can un unmute yourself. So uh, do you see Katie's question there, um, Andrew? Yeah, I sure do, and I'll, I'll read it for the, for the, to be helpful to the group. Um, Katie says, on the Bill Williams, did you all look at a measure such as kilometer of river downstream, I'm assuming the KM stands for kilometer, from the dam impacted by flows? If yes, can you quickly summarize your methodology for calculating? I guess no, KM must be something else. I, I, I'm going to say I'm not sure, Katie. Let, let me come back to you on that. Well, <clears throat> she's going to tell me what KM stands for. Okay, there was kilometers. Yeah, and, and clearly, it's it, it's 40 river miles. So, so we see the entire river corridor is affected by these flows. And and, and then it's you know the higher the flow, the the more impactful the entire uh, upon the entire 40 river miles. Some of these spikes that we've seen didn't get much through Planet Ranch, and so it kind of depends on where in the river system you're talking about. So, any other questions? Yeah, that's a very detailed presentation, Andrew. <laughs> I'm sure people are still processing well, everything I'm in their minds. De oh, no, detailed fine. and overly <laughs> caffeinated, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Bill Werner is having a question here. Let's see. Uh... All right. What's next? Great, great question, Bill. Uh, I, I, I think the what next is you know further refinement of the tools that we have in hand. Um, a really important com consideration is, is how can we bring all this body of work together in a way that's synthesized and, and, and integrated as much as possible. We are in the middle of the Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, um, Army Corps of Engineers are in the middle of, of, of determining the reconsultation in the Endangered Species Act um, context for how Alamo Dam is operated. So that gives us this really vital opportunity to, to bring, to stitch together many of these tools in a, in a way that, that gives us the, the, the best leveraging of the information we've generated to allow the Corps to, to be best in compliance with, with their environmental obligations under the ESA. So that's one near-term near item we have coming our way. We had a bunch of studies set up for this year, um, assuming that it was going to be an El Nino year, and when that fizzled, those, those, those are on hold, but, but that is, is you know, we're, I guess, kind of waiting for, for the next big flow year. God willing, it's not 20 years from now. I think the ESA piece is really probably going to be a, a real important uh, point of focus over the next couple of years. Other questions? Um, one important consideration is, is the development of Planet Ranch as a conservation area. So, so that's critically important. That's probably, it's, it's been many, many years in the coming. Big kudos to the Bureau of Reclamation for carrying the water to get that across the finish line with the federal legislation that it took, supported by Senator Jeff Flake. Um, so so as, as BR continues to protect the water rights on Planet Ranch and, and, and finalizes their, their restoration plans, that they're, they're probably moving towards um, Really, really starting to see, see some changes in the landscape in, in 2020, 2021 or so. So that's another thing for folks to be mindful of. Cool. Uh, looks like there aren't any other questions, Andrew, for now. <laughs> so let's see. Not seeing any hands raised either on the line. Yeah, so folks could raise their hand and, and, and be unmuted, right? Cool. 
or people are just pretty shy today. Mm -hmm. so they're like, no, if we ask him another question, he's going to go on for another 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if not, people can always email us questions, and we'll be sure to forward them on to Andrew um, if they leave something answered. So I guess on that note, we can uh, end the webinar. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for calling in and participating. And thanks a lot, especially to you, Andrew, for, for taking the time to be with us today. And uh, as a reminder, the webinar was recorded, and we'll, we'll be making it available on our YouTube channel. And you can find it by searching for Desert LCC on YouTube, and it should be one of the first results there in the search. So once again, thanks everyone for calling in, and we hope you have a great day. No way, thanks for letting me do this. this is of course, Andrew. Yeah. opportunity to talk about a cool, cool river system. Yeah, thanks. It's very inf informational. All right. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, talk to you soon, though. <laughs> All right, then. Mm -hmm.